Good morning and welcome to the second financial planning faculty study group. Today's topic is domestic asset protection trust and we have a small group today. So hopefully we'll get a lot more interaction and I don't wanna talk the whole entire time period. So please, um, let's make this interact as interactive as possible. <clears throat> I have an agenda here. Hopefully everybody can see my slides. I have a couple of introductory slides, the trusts generally, and the intentionally defective grantor trusts. Um, I don't wanna insult your intelligence and knowledge by discussing these points. So I just have these as uh, part of the uh, PowerPoint for a quick review. Now we have the trust trinity. In a trust, there's three parties, the trustor, settlor, grantor, same terminology for uh, that party. We have the trustee and the beneficiary. And there's two types of trust, the revocable trust, and an irrevocable trust. In the revocable trust context, those three individual parties named above, the trustor, the trustee, and the beneficiary are combined into one person, one individual taxpayer, or if it's a family, if it's two spouses, it's consolidated and combined into the, those two spouses. So the trustor, the trustee, and the beneficiary is the same person. In the irrevocable trust context is when there's a separation between this trust trinity, as I'd like to call it. That there's a trustor, the settlor, the grantor, it's typically one person or spouse, a family, husband and wife, or husband and husband, or wife and wife. The trustee is generally another person and the beneficiaries, um, are a separate distinct group. This is in the irrevocable trust context. <clears throat> a lot of revocable, revocable trust or a portion of a revoc revocable trust becomes irrevocable upon the death of the trustor, settlor, grantor, or one of the trustor, settlor, grantors, if it's a uh, family trust, if it's a spousal trust. A revocable trust can be set up during life by an individual by trustor, settlor, grantor, and it can be set up as a grantor trust or a non-grantor trust. And I'll get into that in just a moment. Any questions, comments on this slide? No, we're good, thank you. We're good. Thank you for pressure. So the next slide is this intentionally defective grantor trust. And what does this do? This trust is set up where it is defective or a broken trust for income tax purposes. In other words, the settlor trustor sets this trust, generally speak, speaking as an irrevocable trust, where all of the income and expense items that occur, all of the transactions that occur within the trust are reported by the individual uh, trustor on his or her individual income tax return. Now this could be set up in two ways. It could be set up as a purely uh, asset protection trust for asset protection purposes. And uh, so it would be defective for both income tax purposes as well as estate and gift tax purposes. That's not why it's typically used. This the, the, the IDGT is typically used for it to be defective for income tax purposes where all the income and expense transactions are reported by the trustor. Uh, but it is set up to be not defective for estate and gift tax purposes. And what it does in that case, it gets the assets out of the trustor's and the trustor spouse's estate. <clears throat> and the bulleted list there are some of the powers that uh, this trustor must retain 
for this trust to be defective, i.e. for the income and expense items to be reported by the trustor or the, the settlor, the, the, the party that formed and set up the trust. If the, trust, if the trustor does not retain one of these or some of these uh, powers listed here, the trust is a, an irrevocable trust that is not defective, it need, it, which means that it is, is a, it's a separate entity, it's a separate taxpayer, and it has to file its own income tax return, both for federal and state, in states where uh, that has, um, impose an income tax on trusts, and it will function as a um, separate entity and a separate taxpayer. So let's jump in into the, uh, the heart of the subject matter of today, the, the Domestic Asset Protection Trust. So what is this? This is a trust that's set up where the settlor and the grantor and the trustor is a beneficiary of the trust, where this party can get benefits from the trust, but the trustee can block creditors from getting access into the trust. There's 17 states, and I got this information from Steve Ocean's website, and Steve Ocean is an estate planning asset protection attorney based in Las Vegas. Um, he has several charts. One of them is this uh, rankings chart, chart that are available on his website at oceans.com. There's 17 states that have asset protection statutes on their books. Some of them, and 33 states that do not. Some of the 17 states are better than others, and there's a few prime plush states that are highly recommended for asset protection purposes. The, um, if the settlor trustor is a resident of one of these states, then they can get the benefits of their state statutes and receive substantial asset protection. The key is when an individual tries to take advantage of these statutes and they're not a resident of one of those states. And how does that work? And I'm kind of jumping forward a little bit to kind of introduce our hybrid domestic asset protection trust that we'll get into in, in just a moment here, in a few minutes. So how does the, the, this DAPT protect an individual? And who are we looking for? <clears throat> uh, who are the clients? There is a comment here. I'll just put the link there. Okay, thank I you. I found that 17 ranking very helpful. Yeah. Um, so who would benefit from these? domestic asset protection trusts. People who are gonna be uh, in high stakes litigation. What are some of the professions that would benefit from this? Your doctors. Orthopedic surgeon. Yeah, doctors and- Your brain surgeon. surgeon. Yeah, most doctors will benefit. Also, real estate developers that are highly leveraged. In the good times, it's great because they can get loans and jump from one project to the other. And when the economy goes on the downswing and real estate is, gets hit hard, like it does every 10, 15 or years or so, like in the early 90s, early 2000s and 2008, nine specifically, those could benefit from this. And then other parties that are involved in, in litigation, maybe a business owner that um, is in a, um, uh, is in a, in a design manufacturing and something goes wrong, primarily small business owners. 
or mid-sized business owners that have that manufacture so you know, i have a question potentially here. risky products yes go ahead mm -hmm. so so i'm glad that you mentioned about uh who is this for so for people generally speaking potentially get sued and so you mentioned about real estate developer um so 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 if i think about uh, it's probably um, people that are 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 above the some sort of limit, so they wanted to get protection from. And I'm assuming this protection is for any kind of assets, right? Or are there specific assets needs to be transferred into this? Um, ERISA based retirement plans mm -hmm. are protected under federal law. Correct. So what we can protect here is other investment assets. Other well, um, brokerage so, accounts. So, yeah. So, for example, if um, every state has annuity has a certain level protected, right? And it doesn't have to be qualified or non-qualified. So, annuity itself has some sort of insurance protection on there. Every state is different. So, I, I would assume that if it's for for investment protection, so outside of the ERISA outside of the minimum annuity protection. So um, in California, how much would that be? There's additional protections too under the bankruptcy statutes mm -hmm. um, that provide some protection as well. Very limited protection, again, Very limited. Based on, this, okay. on states. Um, and the, the federal banks or bankruptcy laws provide some type of protection as well. Okay, okay. Type okay. Items. So, so basically, um, so basically, it's anything outside of those protection. This is where where this will be very useful in case of someone trying to sue uh, for your existing assets. Yes. Okay. Let me. But that's a qualified yes because um, the the two. Let me take a step back. The two items that would be very beneficial to put in these types of trusts is a is a taxable brokerage type account and investment account and real estate. Okay. In, including a primary residence. A primary residence could be included in there as well. Um, one recommendation that most asset protection lawyers make to their clients is for them not to be too greedy and not to put their entire net worth into a, into a trust, but, but put some, let's say 30, 40, 50% of their net worth and keep some outside um, just to provide some level of, of um, uh, protection against attacks. Um, most judges and a lot of lawyers do not like this. Uh, do not like this planning well, idea. Well, um, so, so I have another question. So, so that's, this is um, intentionally trying to protect certain assets, but if it's a husband and wife situation where can husband intentionally put his assets into this and then not allow the wife to have access to it? I, I'm just curious. Yes, it is possible. It, it doesn't depend if it's a community property state or a common law state. I mean, community property state, I can have separate assets that are mine that my wife has no right to because I've had it before my marriage, um, which is sort of like the common law states that still practice where husband and wife assets are still separate. It yeah, this works helpful. Yeah, this works well for um, a um, divorce situation. It also works really well, as Lee mentioned, if either um, one, one of the spouses has substantial amount of separate property assets too. I see. There is a, there is a wrinkle if this trust is set up after the marriage and trying to get community property assets into the trust, and I will get into that after a few slides when I discuss the hybrid domestic asset protection trust because it's a little different and that in that context, I'll mention it now, uh, just to kind of give you a little background. In that context, the set law is not a beneficiary of the trust, but rather the spouse is going to be a beneficiary of the trust. Okay. But let me get to that after a few slides. Let me cover a couple of points here Can that I are very, very, very important. Can I ask one more question, uh, where you were asking 
point of who is this um, uh, best for. Yes. So oftentimes when, when recommending to the clients of certain techniques like these, I always think about, is there a threshold of a certain assets amount to be worthwhile of doing this? Because there's always going to be some sort of fee expense and on an ongoing basis to maintain this. So are there any kind of threshold or guidelines other than who is the best candidate for this, what type of assets, but are there any threshold of how much of the assets value is worthwhile of doing something like this? Yeah, uh, that's a good point. Obviously, the, the, the bigger, the higher the net worth, the better. My gut feel tells me uh, funding this with a million dollars would make sense, but I believe that if, if an individual really wants it, going down to say $500,000 would make sense as well. Um, there is the fee to set these up where an attorney is, is needed to draft these documents. Um, that's going to be a substantial cost, although some attorneys that do this uh, uh, as a large portion of their practice have it down to, to a science. So that's more of a commodity type practice for them. So those their fees might be a little bit lower. And there's the annual maintenance fee, potentially the filing of tax returns and also having the uh, local trustee. Um, so if you're, a, you're not a resident of one of these 17 states, and you would like to set up a trust in one of these states, the statutes require the trust to have a resident trustee. That resident I see. trustee I see. can be an individual or it could be a, a bank or financial yeah, so it's a trust, company. Or trust company. And that, and that company is going to charge an annual maintenance fee. Um, you know, they're in the business of making money, so they're going to require a fee. And I listened to a seminar and the speaker said that there was a trust company that he worked with that was charging $1,800 a year. So it's not a huge number. And depending on what type of services they're providing, obviously, the more services they're providing, it's going to be more expensive. So for, for the bare bones, it looks like it's a few thousand dollars, a couple of thousand dollars. So anything less than several hundred thousand dollars or a million may not be worth the cost um, of having these. Of course, it, it's also facts and circumstances driven as well. Uh, let me discuss the most important aspect of this asset protection trust, and that is the protection against the creditors. A lot of times when I get these calls, and I've gotten a few of these calls over the, my practice, and it's too late actually at least as far as I could tell. Uh, somebody got, has gone into a car crash and there's, some, uh, there's a serious injury and they only have very low or very limited insurance coverage on their vehicle. Well, at that point, if they know or they're expecting a lawsuit, and they get into this type of planning, it's gonna be very, very difficult or almost impossible to provide protection because of the fraudulent conveyance laws. I would like, this, this is a very, very important point and every, all 50, all 50 states in the United States have a fraudulent conveyance laws, which primarily state that um, assets cannot be transferred with the intent to thwart or to make it difficult for a, a known or an, expect, ex, an expected creditor from getting uh, paid on their claim. Um, so if there's a car accident or there's a death or if a doctor has a brain has a brain operation and the patient dies and they're trying to 
this determine whether they should set up this trust after that fact and they have some inclination that they may have done something wrong both with the car accident if there's there's some liability there's some fault or if the doctor has some gut feel that he did something wrong during the surgery it's going to be too late under the fraudulent conveyance laws to set these up a question uh, what about college loans it seems to me we get a college loan i'm in college i get out and i see my payment's going to be five thousand a year and i'm only earning twenty five thousand a year because i'm a social worker uh can i get out of it here or is the same fraudulent law going to apply because my, the ones i run into this are people who have large college loans and quite honestly don't earn income necessary able to support the payment of that loan yeah um i believe it's going to be impossible to get out of that college loan lee because uh, the federal government put in some statutes in place a few years ago that made student loans federally guaranteed student loans now uh, there's a category and most of the student loans the lion's share of the student loans are going to be federal federally guaranteed they will survive bankruptcy they're not dischargeable in bankruptcy and they will be a burden on the individual that took out the student loan and the parties that co-signed them such as a parent for uh, forever um, and i did some research on this um, it's going to fall under the category of this pre-existing creditors, the student loan. And these 17 states, 15 out of the 17, if you look at uh, bullet number three, have statutorily mandated exception creditors. These include things that, such as alimony, child support, and also tort based creditors um, i don't know about student loans um, if it's federal guaranteed we uh, some research has to be done in the federal statutes to see if those would qualify as statutorily accepted creditors or not so with respect to statutorily accepted creditors domestic asset protection trusts don't help so for example, in a divorce, a, a spouse can get into the trust and get child support or alimony. Tort creditors, pre-existing tort creditors can get into the trust and get paid on if they have a judgment and try to, when they're trying to enforce that judgment. That's 15 out of the state, 15 out of the 17 that have asset protection statutes. The two states that don't have pre-existing creditors are Nevada and Utah, and I understand that Utah, if you're not a resident of the state of Utah, these provisions do not help. So um, question, can you, can you give us some example of, the, uh, of a tour creditors? Just, just one or two example. Yeah, uh, somebody re-rents a vehicle and the person driving the, the car that has been re-rented dies. Okay. And that person has a claim, has a potential claim against the person that re-rented them. Okay, got it. That would be a court tort creditor. Okay, got it. Uh, so that patient, means that this, this trust doesn't help if that's, yeah. if that's states, a situation. Okay. In those states that have exception creditors, uh -huh. that includes a pre-existing tort creditor, no, it doesn't. What about, pre Go ahead. what about prenuptial agreements? Uh, I had a client a few years ago who was uh, about 30 years older than his wife and mm -hmm. they signed a prenuptial agreement. And after a couple of years, make a long story short, they were getting uh, divorced and she tried to enforce this prenuptial agreement. And because of the, it was a jury trial, it, she got it. But I'm thinking if he would have had the asset protection trust, would he be able to get out of that? Um, my experience has been, has been that um, 
the prenuptial agreement is recommended on its own, separate from the asset protection trust. The asset protection trust could be set up as a second level or as a second step or as a second line of defense. Generally, if, if the, the parties comply with the statutory requirements of a prenuptial agreement, prenuptial agreement are ironclad. I'm curious of how the uh, younger spouse in your situation was was able to break that prenuptial agreement. Um, they're, um, they're very, very I strong really, in California. Yeah, I, it was a case where they came in, uh, he came, he came in to see me about six months after the fact. I see. And I really didn't, I got his side of the story, but I have no idea of her side. Yeah. If, so if I just parties, was fascinated by the fact that, because uh, I always assume prenuptial agreements are it was a, ch a real challenge to be able to. Yeah, there on. are. There's always yeah. some little asset you forget. There, well, there is one aspect of a prenuptial agreement that could be used to, by the out, outed spouse to break the prenup, and that is when the parties are not represented by counsel. That, that's one of the, re, one of the um, items that comes to mind that can be used by the non-represented spouse. <clears throat> and also, there's a slew, there's a very famous case, Barry Bonds' case, um, that settled the law in California and it was, uh, the state legislature adopted some legislation to codify the provisions in the case. And there's several provisions. If those provisions are satisfied and strictly complied with, the prenup, survives. Now, if your client had an asset protection trust, that could have helped, particularly if he had put in his separate property into a trust in, in one of these friendly jurisdictions. Um, so the asset, the, the, these trusts protect for um, non-pre-existing creditors, so creditors that arise after the trust is set up. And there are ways to protect against pre-existing creditors and each uh, jurisdiction has a certain statute of limitations, anywhere from two years to four years. And in some of these accepted creditors, there's no statute of limitation. So by Using a jurisdiction which provides for shorter statute of limitations, some of these pre-existing creditors or known or unknown can be thwarted by providing notice. Um, and you have to look at the jurisdiction, whether it requires actual notice or notice by publication. Nevada, for example, will, will allow notice by publication and by notifying a, an unread newspaper saying, okay, so-and-so set up an, uh, is setting up a trust and transferring assets will shorten that statute of limitation um, from two years to six months, for example, and that would provide protection for um, against pre-existing creditors. There's a group of seven states that make this, the, their asset protection laws very unfriendly. And that requires a, an affidavit of solvency by the settlor every time a, trans, a transfer is made into the trust. So that makes it very difficult and cumbersome every time a settlor is going to transfer funds into a asset protection trust. And these trusts, by the way, do not, the entire assets of the individual or, um, or a big chunk of them do not have to be transferred or funded at the same time. Additional contributions can be made into a trust um, over um, a, several years. So these states require this affidavit of solvency and for this reason they're not very friendly and not workable. Questions? No. Ch busy taking notes.
<laughs> All right, um, let's see. Setting up these asset protection trusts, the timing is critical. As the saying goes, timing is everything. Timing is very, very important to get it done um, early on before problems start creeping up or problems start happening. Unfortunately, um, working with these high risk individuals, it's very difficult to convince them to pull the trigger and sign on the dotted line. And even though I've had conversations with people regarding uh, setting these up, the compliance aspects and the, and the cost aspects is a, is a hindrance to a lot of people. So most people don't do anything and they, they just let it go until it, and sometimes it's too late. Other times it's okay because nothing happens and there's no issues, but sometimes it's, it's a little bit too late. So what do we do for individuals that do not reside in those 17 states? And California is not one of them. And New, New California and New York are not one of those 17 states that protect individuals. So what do we do? Well, we set up a hybrid domestic asset protection trust. And what is, what is the hybrid? Remember a, a few slides ago, I said a domestic asset protection trust, the set, the trustor, set lord, grantor, the individual that forms the trust is a beneficiary of the trust. So the, the trustor can get distributions out of the domestic asset protection trust. If we have a resident in one of the 33 states that do not provide protection, the, the trustor cannot be a beneficiary of the, of the trust. Why? It defeats the purpose. So what do we do in that case? Well, we, we do not include this, the trustor settlor as a beneficiary. So who becomes a beneficiary? I would say the, the spouse. spouse. The spouse becomes a beneficiary and the children. So and I could, go ahead, I'm sorry. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead Lee. Uh, I have an Alaskan trust. Yes. Uh, that I got in Arizona. It, I think I should be adding this to it to protect the assets that I have in that trust because I don't benefit um, from the trust, but it, my children and grandchildren benefit. And, um, they seems to me having the Alaskan indefinite period plus this would be fantastic. Um, if you're not a beneficiary of the trust, then your creditors will most likely not be able to get access to that trust. Are you the trustee? Gray, gray, gray area. Yeah. Well, there's some there's some issues. It's Alaska a provides a, the. Alaska statutes provide some protection, but they're not as good as, as Nevada, for example. Um, Nevada is probably the top asset protection states that provides the most friendly rules. And here's, and you have to look at each state statute to see if the trust or set law is protected. In your case, Lee, you have to look at the Alaska statute to see if you're protected. And the way that Nevada provides the protection is this. The trust or set law cannot be a current beneficiary, but the spouse can be a beneficiary, and which is well and good in a long-term stable marriage, but how about a newer marriage or an unstable marriage? What do you do? Well, there's a changing spouse language that is being used where the, the spouse as the beneficiary is not named, but rather some general generic language is used just to refer as the trustor spouse. So if the trustor gets divorced, for example, and remarries, the second 
or third or fourth spouse would be covered under this language, the changing spouse language. Um, the trustor can be an investment trustee, can make decisions of what assets to invest in and provide asset allocation, maybe get involved in the sale of an asset or get involved in a 1031 exchange, for example. But the trustor cannot be a distribution trustee. So that's where the third party uh, individual or fiduciary company comes into play where they become a distribution trustee. Obviously, if the trustor is a distribution trustee, they can make distributions themselves and that would defeat the purpose. Again, as I mentioned earlier, at least one trustee must be a Nevada resident. And this, there are some low cost options for this. The last three, items these powers if the trustee has these powers can remove and change a trustee can veto potential distribution and can have a lifetime or testamentary power of appointment these three will not if if the nevada statutes allow the trustee to have these the the the, the trustor the settler our principal in our example to have these powers but if the if our principal has these powers, then this trust will not be helpful from, from a, an estate planning or an estate and gift tax perspective because it will not remove the assets out of the estate. Additionally, uh, there's a new concept now, well, newer. It's, I haven't seen a lot of litigation in this area, but it's being used in a lot more frequency, the trust protector. A trust protector is an individual who is not a trustee but can make changes to the trust and typically it's a friendly party that will make changes that benefit the trust and it benefits the beneficiary and in certain circumstances it benefits the um, the uh, the trustor uh, now a lot of these asset protection trusts are drafted where the trustor, the settlor, or principal can be added as a beneficiary, but that provision is uh, not included in there for use, uh, except in some extreme limited circumstances. And the circumstances that I could think of is when a trust is set up and the spouse is being used as a current beneficiary. So the funds are gonna to go to the spouse, but not the principal, not the set law, and the spouse is going to pay the bills. The spouse is going to pay the Amex bill, the spouse is going to pay the water bill and the gas bill and the, and the, uh, the trip to Hawaii or the cruise in Europe, et cetera. And that's going to be fine because our principal is not going to have funds in their own bank account and their, so their bank account is not going to be subject to levy or if it is going to be subject to levy, there's not going to be anything in the account to levy. The funds are going to go to the spouse. Um, what if the spouse develops a gambling habit or a drug habit? So that creates an issue and this provision here, all the way at the bottom, the underlying provision can be used in this extreme circumstance to add the, the, our principal, our trustor as a beneficiary. Or remove the, the, the current spouse as the beneficiary and leave the children, although getting money from your kids is going to be a difficult task. Any questions or comments? Uh, question in that um, a third party trust that protector is not found in all states. For example, Correct. not found in California. Correct. Um, so, what would I do here in California? Um, for your Alaska trust or for your California trust? Uh, let's say to make, uh, uh, say the California trust. You can have, you can. Well, you can do a, an amendment or a codicil to the trust document 
to add a trust protector and give this trust protector some powers that you did not retain. So this functions, this is used um, and the primary purposes of using the trust protector is in a case where the trustor, the settlor, the grantor has given up their powers. Um, and it's an irrevocable trust where the, where the settlor does not have any powers and the trustee is a third party trustee. So, so a trust protector can be added in and given certain powers, the powers to decant the trust, for example, the powers to remove the trustee, the power to remove and add beneficiaries, the, pro the power to move the trust from California to another jurisdiction. Those are some of the powers that the trust protector can have uh, that the settlor gave up when the irrevocable trust was formed. And when the trust protector is a friendly party, obviously there's going to be communication between the trustor and the trust protector and or the trustee and the trust protector to make this, so the trust protector can make decisions that would benefit the trust and the beneficiaries and indirectly benefit the trustor. Does that answer your question, Lee? Yeah, so in my case, um, the trust benefits my children, does not mention my grandchildren at all. So I have a 30 year old grandson. I could use him as the trust protector. And obviously he has a vested interest in it. Yeah. But he's, not a, he's not a beneficiary. Yeah. Well, if, you're, if your trust document says that at the death of one of your children, um, do it their, do their descendants, okay, the other. Uh, I just you, mentioned the two, two children. Okay. So, what happens at the death of one child? Who inherits the, the corpus? I would suspect the other child. And then what happens at the death, at, at the, death of the survivor? Uh, it would be intestate. Um, do you have a cat? Do you have a residual clause that will grab? Uh, that's it. That's it. That's the thing I forgot was the residual clause. Yes, I have a residual clause. Well, who, who's the beneficiary of the residue? Is it the descendants of both chi children, or is it the des descendant of the survivor? No, it's neither. It's a, ch a charity. It's a charity. Okay. Um, I want the kids to benefit. Uh, and. And then it, uh, I think it this is an irrevocable trust, Lee. Pardon? It's an irrevocable trust? Yes. Okay. So um, in order to make changes to an irrevocable trust, to add trust protector language, I believe that you have to file a court petition and the beneficiaries have to agree including the contingent beneficiary or the residual residual beneficiary. Mm -hmm. It would be difficult, but not impossible to add trust protector language in this specific situation. Um, but I I, in my opinion, Lee, I believe that your grandchild can be a trust protector because he's not, he's not a current beneficiary, he or she is not a current beneficiary and not a contingent beneficiary because the residual clause, everything is going to charity and they're unrelated. Although typically uh, my experience has been to use trust protectors that are unrelated, not family members. Usually it's a business associate, a trusted close friend or um, law partner or, or a uh, uh, very, very uh, or long-term college classmate those are the the um the ideal candidates for trust protector could a trust company be a trust protector um if they're willing to take on that responsibility i don't believe many trust companies would want to do take on this this uh, responsibility i'd prefer it to be an individual where there could be 
um, opportunities to communicate with them and provide some advice and support, I believe a trust company is going to have its hands tied. Uh -huh. Thank you. So we talked about these briefly earlier. So the funds go out to the spouse and the spouse makes the payments. Now, does this help the domestic asset protection trust or the hybrid domestic asset protection trust for individuals that do not reside in those states? Does it help? There has not been many cases in this, in this area that have gone to the courts of appeal. Maybe a handful, maybe a half a dozen cases, even though this regime is, is been, has been on the books for 10, 15 years or so in um, several jurisdictions. What it helps is the legal fees that Im will be imposed on the creditor to try to get access to the trust and go to these other jurisdictions to try to get access to the trust or to undo these trusts. And that provides a big motivation for the creditors to settle. So that's the primary motivation. In fact, I have several estate asset protection lawyers that are recommending to clients and prospective clients to go ahead and set these up even after that tort action happens. For example, even after that car crash happens where the um, individual in the vehicle that was rear-ended dies or the surgeon that botches a surgery and the patient dies or is permanently disabled. These asset protection lawyers are recommending these trusts set up despite the existence of fraudulent conveyance rules on the books. And it's their rationale, their thinking is, what do you have to lose? At the same token, they're not um, they're not telling their clients, well, you're going to end up incurring ten, fifteen, or twenty thousand dollars in legal and administrative and other fees to set this up, and not not the least of which would be a disruption to your life because a lot of your assets have to be transferred. So there's quite a bit of paperwork involved in setting these up, uh, but they're still recommending this and saying, okay, well. It, let the creditors go to court and try to prove a fraudulent conveyance. And that will create a burden on the creditor of additional legal fees and costs, uh, well, which, will, which will motivate the creditors to settle. Now, I don't know whether that's good advice or not. I don't like it personally, um, but it is out there and I wanted to mention that. Some additional ways uh, that a, are the principal, the trustor can get can receive funds. Obviously, the, the most common one is a distribution directly to the beneficiary, which is the spouse who ends up paying the bills. The other one could be to children if there's no spouse, uh, if, there, if uh, the spouse, if there was a divorce um, and the spouse, uh, the, the principal, the trustor did not remarry. For that reason, it's important to have more than one beneficiary, such as a child or children included. The other way would be for the settlor to sell assets to the trust in return for a note. And as the trust is making payments on the note, the trustor can get some funds. And then lastly, the trustor can borrow money from the trust, which is a little bit riskier out of the other options. This is probably the riskiest because the creditors could uh, show to the court that the trustor is borrowing money from the trust and the court could uh, rule that the trustor needs to go and borrow additional funds from the trust to pay the creditor. 
So obviously borrowings have to, all of the I's have to be dotted and all of the T's have to be crossed. It has to be a valid, enforceable, defensible loan where payments are being made. Um, so the, the, the more it looks like a real loan, the better it is for the trust orbit. And this one would be a third um, option to consider. There's some other protections too for asset protection purposes. Outside of the trust context, they can be used in trust and that is the charging order. And that's probably a, a, a lecture or a discussion um, on its own. And what, uh, let me just mention it briefly here. And what this does is, they, with the use of Nevada LLCs, and Nevada has a special statutory regime where if it's a Nevada LLC, the, the operating agreement could be drafted in a way to prevent creditors to foreclose on the LLC interest. So what happens is if we have a member of the LLC, a partner for tax purposes or an LLC member for tax purposes and state law purposes, and it's a Nevada LLC, and it could be operating anywhere, by the way. But this Nevada LLC does not have to operate in Nevada at all, so long as there's, a, you know, there's an agent for service of process in the state the Nevada LLC could have operations anywhere in the United States or overseas. What the Nevada statutes provide the following is if one of the members has a judgment against them, the creditor can step into the shoes, will step into the shoes of the, um, of the LLC member but cannot force distributions out of the LLC. So they be so if they foreclose the uh, interest of um, of this um, court feeser, for example, and they take over this individual's mem member interest, they become a member for all intents and purposes, except forcing the cash distributions out. So they would be sitting there as a member of this entity. They would be charged with the income and the expenses that happen in the LLC, but they cannot force any distributions. This is a very, very powerful tool that could be used independently and as part of a asset protection trust where the trust could own the LLC. So that adds another layer of protection. Um, the second point, as I mentioned earlier, is not to be too greedy and to transfer a portion, but not the entire wealth of the individual for asset protection purposes. There's some other um, planning options too, is to split the trusts into protected trusts and unprotected trusts, where the unprotected trust could be subject to creditor claims, whereas the protected trust would not. Um, and then lastly, as I mentioned earlier, a uh, uh, provision could be, could be included and is generally included to add the settlor as a beneficiary in extreme circumstances. Um, questions? No, it's a uh, very interesting. Yeah, the yeah, fascinating. In my opinion, the, the um, I think the primary, the, the real motivation of setting these up is to create a burden for the creditors, and the burden being the high legal fees of prosecuting an action, and as soon as attorneys find out that there's uh, Nevada LLCs or Nevada-based asset protection trusts where the Bennett, where the, our target, our principal is not a, a current beneficiary, lawyers are not going to be motivated to pursue these types of claims, number one. And number two, 
they're going to tell their client, the creditor, the person who's interested in suing our trust or that um, it's going to cost a lot of money and it's a, um, better to settle. And I thought of an example as I was preparing for this um, presentation discussion. Uh, if we have a $1 million potential claim, for example, um, if a plaintiff's lawyer is going to charge one third as their legal fee, a contingency fee of one third. After our creditor wins their lawsuit and they're able to collect on their judgment, they're going to get somewhere around $700,000, 1 million uh, minus one third legal fees that are paid to the attorney plus costs, they're gonna get 700 or maybe less than 700, let's say 600 for discussion purposes. And, and this is after years, uh, not years, but maybe several months, could be years of litigation and in an enormous amount of um, time, effort and energy. And if this individual is offered a settlement of say, half of that, what they're, they expect to net, 300 or 350, they might just well take it and leave um, and say, and call it a day. Um, and that is the, I believe, the primary motivation of, of uh, creating these as barriers for potential attacks. Okay, I got to leave, but I sure say this is very well worth it. Time for anybody yeah. really to know. I, I yeah. think the example Especially that, any financial planner. Yeah. I think the What's example it? that you mentioned about that that million dollars example, I think that, you know, from and you're absolutely right, that, that actually discourage people to pursue further and then just take the settlement. Yeah. Um, and, and that's probably in some cases are better off for for the for the for the people who's actually suing. Yeah, they're better off from a um, from a, a um, uh, emotional perspective too. If not financial, they're they're better off emotionally because litigation takes a real heavy toll on an individual. Um, of course, if it's a corporation or an entity, it might not be the case. But if it's an individual, it would help take the settlement and just close the book and and move on. And here's my final thoughts, as usual. Well, this was a um, nice presentation. Um, shall I stop the recording, uh, Chia? Yeah, I think that the, the um, I, well, I definitely learned something today. I think that the, uh, the tool is, is helpful, but um, it's like any other planning tool. You have to have them ahead of time. You can't yes. be doing this after something already happened. <laughs> yeah, and they have, and the individuals have to be have to be motivated and and ready yeah. to get into it because it's not easy. The, it's not an easy task, and also no. the fee surrounding it is also a consideration. True. Um, so I, I still I still see that there ought to be some sort of threshold to make it more worthwhile. Yes. Uh, for doing yes. this. Yes. Well, great job. Yeah, I really thank you. Thank it. you. This is great.